All right, good morning, everyone. You know you are, are all the bravest coming out in the cold, right? It's good. Let's stand as we begin our worship this morning with Friend of Gad. Good morning. Thank you for braving the cold. We're glad that you're here this morning and we're excited to be able to worship together. Uh, a small bunch mate though we may be, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us and for the privilege that we have of gathering in this warm place today to worship you. Thank you for safety in the midst of all of this cold and we do pray that you would uh, continue to keep your hands on us as we travel to and from and uh, be with those who are not able to be with us this morning. I know there are a lot of people who just can't get out in this weather, and I pray that uh, as we gather, that they would feel the warmth of your love as well. Thank you again for this day and for this place and the opportunity that we have to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. We have a couple of announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, there'll be no p.m. service tonight due to, can you believe it, it's going to snow. 
I, I know we haven't seen much snow this year, but it's supposed to snow tonight. We spent the last week in North Dakota, and it was warmer there than it is here. Go figure. Took away the argument. I always tell Janelle's family, it's like, you know there are places to live where it's not so cold. And this time they just looked at me like, really? <laughs> Is Iowa one of those places? Uh, so no evening service tonight. Um, and also, just want to give you a, a, my policy, my procedures for how we approach Wednesday nights, because chances are we're canceling again. Um, first of all, our policy is that if school is canceled for the day for weather reasons or for any reason, we cancel our Wednesday night activity. Um, but also, if there is a severe weather watch or warning or advisory, if there's something that says be cautious, I'm not going to run vans and risk things. So based on what they're predicting for Wednesday, there's a 99% chance that there's going to be a pretty severe warning. And uh, so we will not be having Wednesday nights. But that's my policy, just so you know there's a, a method to the madness. Um, a special thank you to McCorkle Motors, and he's supposed to be here this morning. The dealer that procured the van for us um, is in town. He's been at the house, so he's coming in sometime. Uh, but if you see a, a, a guy that doesn't look familiar, he's the one that got our van for us and uh, wanted to thank him publicly. Um, Retirement open house for Jerry Christie was supposed to be last weekend, and it snowed, go figure. And so they've moved it to this weekend, and I don't know if it's going to snow on Friday or not. It may be too cold to snow, um, but anyway, that, uh, that's planned for this coming Friday. And there he comes right now. A special thank you to McCorkle Motors for procuring our new van for us. And there's Terry in the back and Jill. <clears throat> Terry, was a, Terry and Jill were a part of our church in Nebraska, and uh, he's actually procured all three of our church vans and uh, gave us a very generous trade-in for our old ones. And uh, then he also sold us the new one for about $4,000 less than what it would market for. So we're very thankful for that. Um, the mobile food pantry is scheduled for February 7th again. And uh, if you participated, I know a number of you participated last time, it's a great opportunity for us to reach out to the community and, and show Christ's love. Um, if you are interested in signing up for that, there's a sign-up form in the, in the foyer. Uh, Mary Atkins or Beth could answer any questions that you have. Uh, but it's a great opportunity. The, the food pantry brings everything in. They set it all up, and we are just there to help. We'll push grocery carts down to the gym and push them up uh, out of the gym for people full of food, load their cars. So a great opportunity to help. Uh, if you're interested in helping, the next one will be on February 7th. On February 9th, this is going to be a busy week. Um, we're hosting a district quiz meet for both children and teen quizzing. So if you've never seen Nazarene quizzing, this would be a great opportunity for you to observe. But we're going to have the children from at least at the eastern part of the state will be here. And the teens from all over the state will be here. And uh, they will quiz over... The teens are quizzing over the book of John, I think. Anybody know what the kids are quizzing over? Acts. The kids are quizzing over Acts. You can tell that Janelle helps Ava with her quizzing, not me. Um, but it's a great opportunity to see how this works. The kids are, are studying the scripture and they'll be answering questions. Um, we're also planning on offering a meal during that time, so if you're interested in helping with that or uh, we'll need people. There's details in the bulletin to hear memory verses for the kids. Uh, they, and so if you're interested in, in observing or helping, uh, feel free to let us know. And then Grief Share, we'll start our next uh, series of Grief Share on February 18th, and all the details are in the bulletin for that as well. Well, two weeks ago, I was planning to be gone. Last week, I was not planning on being gone. Um, but two weeks ago today, on Sunday morning, I woke up to this. Isn't this a beautiful sunrise? The sun, or the, the clouds had come in with my airplane, I think. I saw the mountains from the plane window and then they were covered with clouds by the time I hit the ground. And it was cloudy the entire weekend. They got a foot of snow in Colorado. And when I woke up Sunday morning, I was really disappointed. I hauled my camera on the plane. I had researched how do you get one of these cameras and all this gear on the plane. And it's like, I'm not even going to get to use this thing. But Sunday morning, the sun came out. And I just want to remind us as we worship this morning with this beautiful snow covered scene here you see how the light is just touching on the tips of the trees sometimes in life it feels like there's just no sunshine left 
Sometimes it feels like life is so overwhelming. And in phases like this, where we're getting snow and cold temperatures, it just feels hopeless. But as we worship this morning, I want us to remember it's not hopeless. There is light coming. There is warm weather coming. (laughs) But God reaches into those dark places. And He may not illuminate everything all at once, but He'll give us just a reminder, just the sunlight on the tips of the trees to remind us that He is at work in our world and in our lives. So with that in mind, let's stand together and continue to worship. Cry! 
Lord, I need you. Let's sing it to him this morning. Oh, oh, oh. 
as we gather together, I know that we come much in need of prayer. We're in one of those spells physically where a lot of people are struggling as we think of this intense cold weather and we're grateful for the roof that we have over our heads and even though the, the gas and electric bills are skyrocketing, we have a furnace and we can pay those bills. But there are many in Davenport and around the area that don't have that warm place. And we certainly want to be praying for them this morning. We had the privilege of gathering some, some clothing items for times such as these. And just a report, we brought in 63 pairs of gloves, 43, 47 pairs of socks, several pairs of shoes that are very much needed at this time of year and, and probably more than what we provided is needed. But we also have a lot of challenges in our church. There's a lot of people facing really tough stuff. And when we come together in this time of prayer, it's a chance for us to, to cry out to God no matter what our need is. Whether it's a physical need, whether it's a, a, an emotional need, whether it's a spiritual need, we have this opportunity to cry out to God and to know that He hears us. So as we sing through this chorus again, our altars are open if you would like to come forward. Or if you would like special prayer, Pastor Larry and Meyer will be available in the corner. If you want to be seated, if you want to remain standing, whatever helps you to focus on Him. But cry out to God and bring before Him the needs. The needs that you are wrestling with, but also the needs of others that we're aware of. I Father, we are so thankful this morning for the privilege that we have of gathering in this place. We're thankful for the warmth that we have here. We're thankful for the warmth that we have at home. But Father, we recognize that there are many in our community that are struggling greatly right now. Many who don't have a warm place to call home. and Many who may not be able to afford the heat bills that are coming as a result of this intense cold. And I pray that you would be very close to these who are, who are struggling. And as you prompt us, would we be generous in helping those who are in need? Thank you for the effort that was put forth and the work that, that was done to deliver these uh, gloves and socks and, and shoes. But Father, I pray that you will help us to continue to do more, to continue to, uh, to see the needs of those around us, especially in these days. Father, I also pray for those who are struggling physically, those who are facing surgeries, those who are uh, wrestling with cancer, those who are wrestling with physical challenges. And Father, there are many in our congregation, there are some here in our congregation that aren't here this morning because they're with family who are facing these types of surgeries. And I just pray that you would surround these with your love and your grace. And we pray that you would be the great physician in these situations. And, and move through the doctors and the nurses and the medical help that's available, but, but move beyond what the doctors can do. And Father, for those who are struggling with emotional challenges and the realities of life that seem overwhelming, I pray for your grace to be sufficient in these hours. I pray that you would surround them with your peace and with your presence, and that they would sense that even though the difficulties still exist, that you are with them in these difficulties. Father, for those who are struggling in relationships, trying to figure out how to navigate the, the realities of relationships that aren't what they're supposed to be for husbands and wives, for parents and children, 
I pray that you would be at work in these relationships. And Father, for those who are struggling in financial areas, trying to figure out how the bills are going to be paid, and especially these heat bills that are coming in, I pray for your, your grace for them as well. And for the many in our congregation who are wrestling with the realities of grief, the loss of someone recently, I just pray that you would continue to surround them with your peace and with your presence. And I thank you that you are always with us and you promise to never leave us or forsake us. And Father, I know that we each come in with our own challenges. We each come in carrying burdens. And we take a few moments just to silently lift those concerns to you this morning. Father, I thank you that you hear us and we pray. That we're not talking to just hear ourselves talk, but we are communicating with the creator of the universe. And I thank you. Thank you that you hear us. and Thank you that you respond. And Father, at times when we're not exactly sure what to say, when our words escape us, we draw heavily upon the words that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen and you may be seated We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lord. We will glorify the Lord of Lords. Who is the great I am? And Lord Jehovah. and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it, and the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Call me out upon the waters, the 
great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you
You may be seated. All right, and if our ushers will come forward at this time, we'll continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Mike, could you pray for our offering this morning? Lord, thank you for being with us in your Holy Spirit and for our fellowship together. Thank you for all that you do for everyone in this world every day in every way. Thanks for your love, grace, mercy, blessings, and guidance. Please bless our offering today. For all power, honor, praise, and glory is yours forever. Amen. Amen. This morning we continue our journey through the book of Ezekiel. And uh, I have to be honest with you, I had no idea where I was going when we started this journey through Ezekiel. This is not a book that I've studied a lot. It's not a book, I don't think I've ever preached a sermon out of Ezekiel prior to this series. It's one of those books of the Bible that uh, can be very challenging. It's one of those books that um, is very difficult to read. Uh, this week, again, there were several sections of the Scripture that it was just overwhelming to read. And we study it, though, because we believe in the entire Bible, not just the comfortable parts. I wish, if I were developing a religion, I would develop one that was a lot more comfortable. I would develop one that doesn't have passages like we read this week. But it's not my job to develop a religion. It's my job to study Scripture and understand what God has called us to and what it means to walk in relationship with Him through difficult times, through challenging times. So far in Ezekiel, we have covered 
um, quite a bit. We looked on January 6th, which incidentally was my last message. I'm going to turn this organ on. I don't know if anybody else, turn it off. I don't know if anybody else hears a squealing. Mary, when you come and start to play later, make sure you turn it on. (laughs) My last message, I had intended to be gone for one message in Ezekiel, not two, uh, but last week, as most of you know, uh, Janelle's grandfather passed away, and we were in North Dakota last week, Um, and crazily, it was nicer weather there than here. Anyway, I won't belabor that point. But my last message, we looked at the fact that Ezekiel is a part of a bigger story. It fits in the Old Testament. It tells the the story of God at a specific instance in time. But it's a part of the bigger story of the nation of Israel. The story of Ezekiel comes at, at one of the most tumultuous periods of the Old Testament. When God had brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, He had brought them to a land and He'd made a covenant with them that if you obey Me, if you follow what I have set before you, I will keep you in this land. I will protect you. But they didn't. And the Old Testament is really this cycle of of stories where the people of God are in the land that God has given them and they start sinning. And they end up in utter despair. God will turn them over to another nation or something. They call out to God, and God rescues them and reestablishes them in the land. But they never leave the land in that, in that cycle. Other nations will come in and conquer them or will come against them, but, but they never leave the land. But towards the old, end of the Old Testament, there's this period that we call the period of exile, where the world powers are fighting like crazy, And three world powers rise in quick succession to one another. And there's another one that's fighting for prominence there. The Assyrians have destroyed what's known as the northern kingdom, so the northern part of Israel. And then come the Babylonians, and they capture the southern part of Israel. And they take all of the best and the brightest from Israel, from Jerusalem, and they send them to Babylon. The goal of this is to integrate them into the Babylonian life, and they will take the best and brightest, and they will blend in with the best and brightest from the other nations that the Babylonians have conquered, and soon Babylon is one great nation of the best and the brightest people. But the Babylonians, while the, the Jews are in, captive, or in captivity and in, in exile in Babylon, the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians. But this story, Ezekiel's story, comes in the time when they first arrived in Babylon. And they're trying to figure out, Ezekiel is one who is exiled with them. Ezekiel is trying to communicate to them, what does it mean to be the people of God in the midst of a pagan culture where you're being constantly submitted to attacks from the outside telling you that you don't have to do things your way. That their way is better. After all, they conquered you. What does it mean to be the people of God in that? When everybody else is living very sinful lives around you, what does it mean to be the people of God? And a huge emphasis in the book of Ezekiel as was the emphasis in the book of Jeremiah, as was Isaiah, who were all writing at the same time. A huge emphasis is the the message that we have to be sure of which kingdom we are loyal to. And that is the kingdom of God. And we can't, in our loyalty to the kingdom of God, be so sucked into the kingdoms that surround us. For the Jewish people, They couldn't get so sucked into the the Assyrian kingdom or the Babylonian kingdom or the Persian kingdom. They had to learn to be loyal to the kingdom of God in the midst of these other kingdoms. And I think there's great danger for us in America as well. 
especially at this juncture in our history where we're living in such division and nothing is for the good of the people it's all about whatever politi- what side of the political aisle you're on and we have to be careful as Christians today to not get so sucked into the kingdoms around us that we miss what it is to be the people of God because being the people of God is not a political statement. Being the people of God is loyalty to one kingdom. And we are, as the writer of Hebrews would say, aliens in a foreign land. And that's what Ezekiel is trying to communicate to the Jewish people as well. You are the chosen people of God, but you're living in a foreign land. Maintain your identity as the people of God in this time and in this place. And I said this a couple of weeks ago, but you probably forgot because I think I had. We have to make sure that we understand what kingdom we're loyal to and not allow ourselves to get so caught up in the kingdoms around us. We have to make sure that we're being discipled by this and not by CNN or Fox News. We have to make sure that this is where our source of truth comes from. Not the media that surrounds us. Ezekiel is a part of a bigger story. But Ezekiel fits into this bigger story because it's it's answering the question, what does it mean to be God's people in difficult times? And even though things for the exiles that Ezekiel was writing to were extremely uncomfortable, they had to remember to not take the easy way of just blending in, but to maintain their identity as the people of God. Because that's a part of the bigger story. If the Jews who were in Babylon had just blended in which is what we believe happened to the northern kingdom when they were hauled off to Assyria. They never came back home. We assume they just blended in. Then there would be no Jesus because Jesus had to come from the line of David. So the the story of Ezekiel is, is a story that says, please maintain your identity because God has things He wants to do through us yet. And if we get so caught up in the kingdoms around us, if we just blend into the world and nobody sees that there's a difference between being a Christian and not, then the work that God has to do through us goes undone. On January 13th, Janelle preached and shared that that Ezekiel calls people to God's heart. He talked about how God was a jealous lover who had been spurned, and we read that section this week. It was rather uncomfortable. When Ezekiel went through this this rehearsing of the details of how the Israelites had gone after every lover that passed their way. And then at the end of this, this, this calling them out, he says, you're not even a proper prostitute because you don't charge people to sleep with you you pay them to sleep with you now that's uncomfortable to read it's uncomfortable to think of but that's exactly what the Israelite people were doing to God he said you have taken the clothing that I have given you and you have taken that clothing and worn it to market your wares you have taken the the perfumes that I have given you, and instead of using them to worship me, you have used them to seduce lovers. God is a jealous lover. And God wants us to love Him with all of our heart. That was the, the, the crux of what Janelle shared. And then last week, Amy S. preached and shared that God has has told us that He will be a sanctuary for us. Even when we're in difficult situations, 
He will be that sanctuary, that place of refuge for us. He promised that to the exiles, and He promises that, that to us today. Now this week in our reading in Ezekiel, we looked at the idolatry of the Jewish leaders, the certainty of the Lord's judgment, the parable of the useless vine, an unfaithful wife, which I've just rehearsed, the story of two eagles, the justice of a righteous God, and a funeral song for the kings of Israel. There's a lot in what we covered this week. There are many powerful messages. Most of them very uncomfortable. And as I worked on the message this week, it's like, well, that one's uncomfortable. That one's uncomfortable. God, you got anything that feels good this week? We're going to focus on Ezekiel chapter 18. And it's not super comfortable. But there are some signs of hope in what Ezekiel has to say. Looking at the justice of a righteous God. This is a message from the Lord that comes to Ezekiel. And it's a challenge really to the grumblings of the Israelites. So we're going to read through this uh, part of this chapter here in a moment. And I just want you to, to understand as you come into this passage that Ezekiel is responding to the grumblings, to the whinings of the Israelites. Now this last week, Janelle and I and the girls spent 32 hours in the vehicle together. And I was very grateful that our girls are older now. Because I can remember taking this trip about four years ago, and there was an awful lot of whining and grumbling and complaining, are we there yet, honey? We just started. We have a couple of days in the car. This time it was actually kind of refreshing because the girls didn't whine and complain and we were all able to listen to some audio books together and it was an enjoyable time. But these, the exiles are grumbling. They're complaining. They're whining. And so Ezekiel is giving this message from the Lord really in response to their grumblings. Their grumbling, and their grumbling focuses on the, the issue of they're in exile, but it's not their fault, it's everybody else's fault. We've seen an awful lot of that in our government the last few weeks, haven't we? I don't care which side of the political aisle you sit on, it's everybody else's fault. Nobody will fess up and say, hey, let's work together for what's best. It's no, my side has to win, or no, my side has to win. But God wants the exiles to accept responsibility because you cannot be the people of God if you do not accept responsibility for what you have done. The Bible is very clear, both Old Testament and New, that we've all messed up. We've all made mistakes. We've all sinned. No one is perfect. No one has lived that life that says, I've never messed up. We've all messed up. And God wants to, wants to start a relationship with us but in order to start a relationship, we have to accept responsibility. And so God is speaking through Ezekiel to these exiles, saying, I have something very powerful for you to do. I have something, a great nation that you're to become. But you have to accept responsibility for your sin and stop blaming everyone else. So if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along with me, we're going to be looking at Ezekiel. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 18. And we're going to skip around. We're going to start, I think, with verse 1 and go through... I believe verse 4, and then we'll jump towards the end of the book. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Why do you quote this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouths pucker at the taste. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you will not quote this proverb anymore in Israel. For all the people are mine to judge, both parents and children alike. And this is my rule. The person who sins is the one who will die. And then jumping to the end of the chapter, starting with verse 19. What you ask, doesn't the child pay for the parent's sins? No, for if the child does what is just and right and keeps my decrees, that child will surely live. The person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for the parent's sin, and the parent will not be punished for the child's sin. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior, and wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. 
But if wicked people turn away from all their sins and begin to obey my decrees and do what is just and right, they will surely live and not die. All their past sins will be forgotten and they will live because of the righteous things they have done. Do you think that I like to see wicked people die? Says the Sovereign Lord. Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. However, if righteous people turn from their righteous behavior and start doing sinful things and act like other sinners, should they be allowed to live? No, of course not. All their righteous acts will be forgiven and they will die for their sins. Yet you say, the Lord isn't doing what's right. Listen to me, O people of Israel. Am I the one not doing what's right? Or is it you? When righteous people turn from their righteousness, righteous behavior and start doing sinful things, they will die for it. Yes, they will die because of their sinful deeds. And if wicked people turn from their wickedness, obey the law, and do what is just and right, they will save their lives. They will live because they thought it over and decided to turn from their sins. Such people will not die. And yet the people of Israel keep saying, the Lord isn't doing what's right. O oh, people of Israel, it is you who are not doing what's right, not I. Therefore I will judge each of you. O oh, people of Israel, according to your actions, says the Sovereign Lord, repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Put all your rebellion behind you and find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O oh, people of Israel? I don't want you to die, says the Sovereign Lord. Turn back and live. There's judgment in this passage, but there's an awful lot of love and grace in this passage as well. When we look at this concept of the justice of a righteous God, it's not comfortable. But throughout this story, God is wanting to make clear the areas of confusion. And you know, I haven't watched much news over the last couple of weeks. I've been on the road over the last couple of weeks and just trying to get the essentials done. But what news I have heard has been a whole bunch of this and this and just pointing fingers at one another. And nobody's telling the truth. It's all fighting for power. It, it's all, no, I want my way. No, I want my way. And we can't agree on the good thing, even though both sides support it or have supported it in the past. Things that one person said has been quoted against them and things that another person has said has been quoted against them. And sometimes you just want to say, can we just stop and tell the truth? And that's what God is doing here through Ezekiel. The Israelite people have been grumbling and complaining They've been whining about things and God just says, will you just shut up for a minute and listen and tell the truth? Enough of the lies. Enough of misrepresenting one another. And he starts with this misquoted parable. The parents have eaten sour grapes, but the children's mouths pucker at the taste. In other words, the exiles were saying, it's our parents' fault. It's their sins. It's the way they taught us to live. That's why we're here in exile. It's not our fault. We shouldn't be suffering. It's their fault. God says, seriously? You can't make up your own mind? You can't tell the difference between right and wrong? Because I've made it clear to you the difference between right and wrong. The exiles were saying that they were in exile not because of their own behavior, but because of their parents' sin. Their assumption was that they had no control over their behavior. When they were living in sin, when they were worshiping other idols, when they were living in adultery as God called them out for, well, it's just what we were taught. We didn't know any better. But they did. They were saying they were taught what they were taught, they were doing what they were taught to do. But they knew the truth. Now, I want to clarify that it is true that children tend to reap what the parents sow. The reality is that children 
tend to grow up based on the families that they grow up in. Their view of the world is shaped by the world they grow up in. This week we had the privilege of celebrating Janelle's grandfather who lived 95 years. His early years were very, very rough. He grew up in a, in a very rough environment. But his mother got saved and his wife got saved. And they prayed for him until he got saved. And the trajectory of his life shifted. And truthfully, Janelle and I bear or, or reap the, the fruit of what he sowed in our faith, in our tradition with this church in particular as we were cleaning out the the apartment that he lived in we came across a hymnal we actually came across several hymnals and several bibles but one of the hymnals that belonged to his mother was the very first hymnal that the church of the nazarene put out in 1931 now i've seen a lot of hymnals in the church of the nazarene and we have a bunch of them hidden in storage rooms here but i'd never seen the 1931 it was enjoyable to look through, and um, thankfully we were able to take that. So we have that, that hymnal to, I plan on looking through it a lot more as time allows. We benefit from the relationship that Clarence had with God, as has Janelle's dad and Janelle's siblings. However, Clarence's grandparents were not Christian, and he was not doomed to hell just because they were living a sinful life but he was able to receive the grace of God when it was offered and change the trajectory of his life even though his family had gone a different direction children eventually have the opportunity to make their own choice we every one of us in this room has the opportunity to make our own choice regardless of what our parents have chosen or our grandparents have chosen we have the opportunity to make our own choice. We can make this, the choice to follow in the footsteps of parents, or we can go another way. And that works both ways. Because some who are raised in a very godly home make the choice to live a very sinful life. And some who are raised in a very sinful home can make a choice to live a very godly life. We are not locked in to the behavior of our parents, whether good or bad. We are given the freedom to make our choice. And what God is telling the Israelites is, your excuse is not a good excuse. You can sit here all day and blame your parents, but you have to make the choice. What choice are you making? And right now, you're just making the choice to blame. In verses 5-18, through 18, the section of chapter 18 that I skipped, Ezekiel gives a case study, and I'm going to give you the very brief version a man is righteous he does what is right and his son is wicked and does everything that is wrong but his grandson is righteous and does everything that is right are all doomed to death because of the sins of one or are all saved because of the righteousness of the two no justice is given to all according to his or her actions God offers correction to those who are living in sin. That's a part of why we read the whole of Scripture, the whole Bible, instead of just picking out the comfortable parts. Because God does offer correction to us when we're living in sin. And this passage says it as well as any other passage in the Old Testament, that God offers forgiveness to those who repent. God offers life to all who seek Him. But there's another excuse that comes out in the end of this. The Lord isn't doing what is right. A couple of years ago, we looked at the book of Job. And in Job, there was kind of the same call. Job, in his frustration, said, I, I did what is right, I don't understand. The Lord's not doing what is right. But it's a very different scenario for Job than it is for the Jewish people. Because they're saying the Lord is not doing what is right even though they have lived very sinful lives. They say our suffering is not deserved. God isn't being fair. Now up to this point in the book of Ezekiel, he's laid out the case, God's case against the Israelites and why they're in exile. They have, 
They have sinned more than the pagans around them, God said. And yet they don't understand why they're suffering in exile. They didn't perceive it to be fair. Because they said other people have done worse. In other words, everybody else is doing it. You ever heard that excuse? You ever given that excuse? Here's the point of this passage. The point of the book of Ezekiel. God calls us to be His people. He calls us to imitate Him. That we should be the reflection of God in this world. In the New Testament, we see that. Paul talks a lot about being Christ-like. Being like Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament, God had chosen a nation. And He put them at the crossroads of the world so that everyone who passed through would be able to see this nation and say how great is their God. But they had abandoned their, their calling. And instead of imitating God, they had imitated the sinfulness of others And they had taken it well beyond the sinfulness of others. And God calls us to be His people even if everybody else is doing something different. God calls us to be His people even if everyone is sinning around us. And here's another beautiful part of this passage. And I think it's a powerful reminder to us that God does not delight in punishing the wicked. Because I do. I'll be honest with you, I do. And next Sunday night, I'm going to be rooting for the Rams, and I don't like the Rams. But I just think that the wicked need to be punished, and Doug's not even here, Dacian's not even here to hear me ranting against their patriots. It's our human nature to delight in the punishment of the wicked. It's our human nature to want people who come across as arrogant. We want to see them fall and bust their tails on the ice. There have been a number of videos going around Facebook, and they go around Facebook just because we like to see the wicked punished. Somebody being a real smart aleck, and then they turn to walk away, and they fall and bust their face. But if we're to be like God, imitating Him, we need to understand this key point. God does not delight in punishing the wicked. It breaks God's heart that people ignore the life that He calls them to. God's desire for everyone in this world is that we would live lives that glorify God That we would love one another. Not that we would be so focused on ourselves and getting our way. God offers a gift of grace in this passage. That as I've studied the rest of the the Old Testament, I don't think I've seen it as beautifully laid out as I see it here in chapter 18 of Ezekiel. And let's read the end of this passage again. Starting with verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, each of you, O people of Israel, according to your actions, says the Sovereign Lord. Repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Put all rebellion behind you and find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O people of Israel? I don't want you to die, says the Sovereign Lord. Turn back and live. One of the areas that we struggle with the Old Testament is very often in the Old Testament there seems to be this this concept that, that wicked people die because they deserve it. And and it again, we kind of like that as humans, but we don't like it when we're on the receiving end of it, but we like to see wicked people suffer. But God is telling us that when He punishes a nation or when He punishes an individual, it's not because He wants to. He does not desire, He does not like to see people punished. 
The truth is, though, that we will all be judged by our actions. We're not judged by what others are doing. We're judged by our actions. If we're living sinful lives, then God calls us to repent. He doesn't call out and say, I told you you were worth nothing. Come here. He says, no, turn back. I don't want to punish you. I I don't want you to die. I don't want you to destroy yourself. Come back. To turn from our sins. To put our rebellion behind us. He says, don't let your sins destroy you. But find the new heart that God offers through Christ. Now that's me putting the New Testament on top of the Old Testament, but that's what Ezekiel's saying. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have the ability to be forgiven for our sins. And a new heart can be given to us. Paul says that that we're not the same as we used to be. We are a new creation in Christ. We are given a new heart. And he even says, accept the Spirit that God gives you. The Holy Spirit, which is relatively unknown in the Old Testament, that we know a lot about because we just finished the Gospel of John. The Spirit of God that, that comes and lives inside of us, that God Himself lives in us. God, God says to Ezekiel, accept this new heart that God offers. Accept the new Spirit that God offers. Turn back and live. And I guess the question for us today is do we need to experience God's grace today? And here's the deal. I don't care if you've been a Christian your entire life. Sometimes we get too caught up in the kingdom around us. And we need to be reminded of God's grace. Very frequently for me, I get too caught up in the chaos of life and the stuff that's going on and I get angry and I get irritable and I need to be reminded of God's grace and I think sometimes we just need to to stop and say God you know I need a fresh dose of your grace today I need to confess that my attitudes have been sinful sometimes my words have been sinful sometimes my actions have been sinful God, I need your grace. And God says to Ezekiel, come back, because I have life for you. I have something for you that is better than what you can find on your own. Don't live a life of destruction. Don't live your lives continually in sin. But come back, because I have something beautiful to offer you. Repent. Turn from your sins and accept the gift that God offers. As our worship team comes, we're going to close with the song, Lord, I Need You. We sang it earlier today, but I I think it, it fits this message that Ezekiel offers. And these first words, Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. I think it's important for us to be reminded of God's grace. And I find it, again, I've not studied the book of Ezekiel prior to this section. I, I've not, um, I've read it, but I've not studied it. I don't ever remember reading this passage of Scripture before. But in the midst of the Old Testament, in the midst of the judgment, in the midst of the, of the, the wrath of God as we've seen in, in reading the first part of Ezekiel, God very clearly offers grace. And in the midst of the chaos that we live in, in the midst of the the political unrest, in the midst of, of all that we face in this world today, God offers grace. So, are we being shaped as the people of God? As Ezekiel is calling the exiles to be. Or are we being too heavily influenced by the kingdoms around us as the exiles were? Let's stand together as we close in song. Without you, I find.
Cause you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and talked about how God wants us to love him with all of our hearts. God wants us to need him every hour. God wants us to call out to him in the midst of our struggle. God wants us to reflect him. So my prayer for us this week is that we will be the people of God, loyal to his kingdom, not so confused by the kingdoms around. Heavenly Father, may it be said of us that we truly did represent you in this place and this time. That even though everybody else is doing something different, even though it's easy to blame somebody else, help us to be your people in this time. Help us to be loyal to you and to your kingdom and not so distracted by the kingdoms around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you are dismissed.